I think we're on. So welcome everyone to another edition of the Perception and Action Journal Club. Um, I was just saying, <laughs> we were talking a minute ago, I said if I went back in time, I would probably change the name of this from Journal Club to Roundtable, because <laughs> we very rarely talk about one specific article. It's more about topics. And and that's definitely true today. Uh, no, I could pick out some articles, I'm sure, but this is kind of going to be a kind of open discussion, think aloud kind of about verbal instruction. So I have two guests here today. I'm happy to for uh, returning <laughs> in both from interviews and doing one of these before. So uh, I'll let them introduce themselves. Rajiv, how are you doing? Good. Uh, thanks for having me on again. So I'm uh, Rajiv Raghunathan. I'm an associate professor in the kinesiology department at Michigan State. I'm interested in motor learning and its application to rehabilitation. And Andrew. Cool. Hello, everybody again. I'm Andrew Wilson. I'm a reader in psychology at uh, Leeds Beckett and Leeds in the UK. And uh, yeah, I do I do experiments and um, theory stuff around the ecological approach and perception and action. And so uh, for those following along, of course, uh, if you have any comments or questions you want to put in here, we're happy to talk about them. As I said, it's going to be a pretty open discussion. So if you have anything. So basically what we wanted to talk about today is ver verbal instruction from a coach, right? So what should a coach say? And I posted a kind of a, a teaser on Twitter uh, earlier. That's it, it, kind of a joke, but it's sort of true, right? We've gone from bashing coaches for saying too much, right? They're being overly prescriptive and you shouldn't say, you, you should move, be a designer more than an instructor to almost this other extreme a lot of people believe where we, we're promoting that coaches should say nothing at all, right? Mm. It's all about designing a practice, setting some constraints, and then you stay out of the way and let the athletes self-organize. And I, obviously those are over exaggerations, but so what we want to do is, you know, what, what's in the middle ground there, right? What, what should a coach be saying? Um, what should a coach be instructing? And, and of course, there's lots of rules for what coaches say, you know, motivational, all, all these goals. But we want to focus on skill acquisition. Kind of mm -hmm. people. So that's primarily what we want to focus on. And we'll, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. So what, what inspired this a little bit for me was inviting uh, you two guys was a couple. Yeah, I think Andrew started a Twitter thread. You, you're doing a lot of the <laughs> <laughs> raising. Uh, and then, um, you know, raised, and it was, you know, it was a lot of it was you were just kind of posing questions, kind of thinking mm -hmm. aloud exactly what I was. And then uh, you've had a very nice response, kind of a differing view, which mm -hmm. I think a lot of people uh, would subscribe to. So that's what kind of inspired me to invite you guys on to do this. So maybe it would make sense, Andrew, to start with you again <laughs> and, and uh, talk about kind of what what you were your thread and kind of what you were thinking about with that. Yeah, cool. So, um, yeah, I the issue of verbal instruction and what you can and can't do with it has sort of become a flashpoint, at least on social media. I don't know if actually in person, but on social media, on Twitter, it's really become a flashpoint for the ecological types versus the not ecological types. And one of the big things that keeps coming up uh, from the non-ecological types is, well, you know, um, you say I'm not allowed to talk to my athletes. And that's like, that's clearly not true. But then the issue is, well, there is this, within the ecological sort of approach to coaching at the moment, there is an, a, not an aversion, but a, a, there is a, a, a move away from verbal instruction and the emphasis becomes about designing physical environments. And so I was just, my initial thread was mostly just sort of thinking out loud about why that was. Why is it, <clears throat> like, where has that preference come from and why is it, why is it there? So from my point of view, it's about thinking about what verbal instruction can do to for skill acquisition. And one of the things that from an, from an ecological point of view it, it can't do is it can't make you perform a movement in a, in a specific way. It can't, verbal instruction is, the, is not the kind of thing that can make you, that changes the kinematics of a motion, right? You can use verbal instruction to say, pick up the red cup versus pick up the blue cup. Right, but then the details of that reach to grasp movement are all about the law-based use of in perceptual information about the location of the cup, about its affordances for grasping, and all that sort of stuff. So, <clears throat> from an ecological point of view, one of the issues around using verbal instruction is that it's really limited. 
and what it can do. If you want people to move differently, um, then actually what you really need to do is you need to present them with perceptual information that's being created by the affordances of a tar of a physical environment because that's the kind of that's how we organize our movements in real time <clears throat> so that's i think like lurking under that is kind of that's the, the that's the one of the ideas of that's lurking under the sort of the the reticence around using verbal instruction from an ecological approach i think um then the other part of it so, so well so then the question is well are you not allowed to use verbal in, instructions I, I I don't think, and I think uh, hopefully we'll you know we'll get we'll get into this. I, clearly, it's not the case that you can't use verbal instructions. The question is, what can you use them for, and what can you not use them for, in terms of in terms of shaping these things? So, what I was getting up to was on Twitter. Well, I was just I was just thinking through why we think verbal instruction might be a bug rather than a feature. And part of the issue is, again, that given given the way we think about where uh, actual performance and skill acquisition, how that happens in terms of perception action loops and all that sort of good stuff. Um, if, you want to, if you want to interface with those, then actually verbal instructions might, it, sorry, verbal instructions uh, created without an understanding of what the per physical environment is affording and, uh, and enabling is just gonna get in the way, right? So, um, and, that, and that's why there's that, re that reticence. You want people to self-organize their movements and think about the way those movements happen rather than doing one thing rather than another thing, then you've got to manipulate the physical environment. But then the big question, and I think um, I'll hand over to Rajiv at this point, is that, um, so now the question, well, what can you do with them, right? And like, where, where do we go from there? Yeah, no, I think that, and if I, to set you up, <laughs> so obviously in verbal instruction in the ecological approach is not something that doesn't fit. It's, it's a constraint, right? It's, yeah. a, it's a task constraint. Um, we, it perfectly fits within the model, but the one, I think, dominant idea, I think that you're kind of expressing it, Andrew, is, is using verbal instruction in a completely different way. Mm. Like for example, to educate attention, to point to it, rather than in a more prescriptive, this is mm -hmm. how you should do the activity. So yeah. kind of, and there's this kind of super, and I've been part of the movement away from any type of prescription in terms of the movement. And Rajiv, I think you you kind of, whoa, <laughs> um, maybe that we're running away from that too fast, right? Um, I think that's part of what your message I was trying to get in your-, your Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I think, again, yeah. I, I trained with Carl yeah. Knoll, so I mean, I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a big fan of the constraints approach, no, no doubt. Um, I, I, I just think, I mean, I've been thinking about this more recently is whether, um, you know, almost presenting this uh, dichotomy between constraints and prescription is is sort of as real as you know we try to make it in theory and and so like you know going back to verbal instructions right if if i told somebody hey you know whatever extend your elbow this way and flex your wrist this way you know some something say that, that we would normally think of as being uh, very prescriptive um i still think it it still poses only a constraint right it, it's the, the person has an understanding of what they are supposed to do, but th there isn't, I mean, again, in my view, it's, it's not a prescription in the sense of the person is going to do exactly the same thing that you told them. They're still going to somewhat approximate mm -hmm. it, right? I mean, they're, they're not going to really do exactly the thing that you said just because you prescribed it. And so I, I was thinking about more of the idea of, well, you know, maybe this trying to force everything between prescription and constraints um in practice may not be as real as a difference as we'd like to see yeah. it in, in theory and 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 again sort of going back to the idea of these uh you know we talked about this idea of you know prescription is towards some optimal movement pattern right which, mm -hmm. which of course you know ignores a lot of stuff in the sense that well not everybody has the same optimum even for the same person it may vary and so on uh but i think the I, mean, I was just thinking about it in the sense of well the optimum approach right the guiding people towards some optimum approach may not really be a, a desired endpoint but rather sort of a practical compromise right so if you, if you don't know all the solutions that work really well and and you have a few individuals who you know who you know are already very good i mean i'll take mm. baseball pitching as an example right so you know mm. the throwing form of people who can pitch at 100 miles an hour. Um, 
well, maybe it's not such a bad idea to use that as at least a approximation of, well, at least I know these will get there. Um, hmm. If you sort of take a pure uh, constraints approach and, and not prescribe anything, um, it could potentially lead to some, you know, suboptimal exploration, right? Exploration is good, but exploration can also be suboptimal in the sense that you find something mm -hmm. that works for the moment, but sort of prevents your long-term advance in terms of uh, skill acquisition. So I was just thinking about it in terms of maybe, yes, if somebody really believes there's only one optimal approach for everybody, that may not be as, as good, but the idea of guiding people towards some optimum might still have some value in the absence of information about what other things actually could could potentially work. Yeah, and I, th I think there's a lot of good points there. And I think it's almost a straw man in the opposite end, like the constraint. Mm -hmm. Like the example, I was, you know, Bernstein's blacksmith doesn't suddenly do underhand one time and sidearm, <laughs> right? There's, I think you're talking, there's a coordination there's yeah. a profile to a good baseball pitcher. Right. Some can throw underhand, but but so maybe we should give you, okay, here's what basically what you need to do, right? right. In some way, you know, um, even though um, my, my worry is sometimes I've seen with, I think there's a lot of different things to pull it. I've, I remember kind of a prescriptive approach to when I learned golf was taught golf as a kid. Mm -hmm. And it seemed, the, the problem I had with that, it was, if, if you let me, I totally agree with. I think we all agree that I'll point uh, Fr uh, Fran ba Franz Bosch was sum, sum up the body has little interest in what the coach has to say. <laughs> you, you can't tell, you're right, you can't make people. But it seems like a lot of the early, really traditional coaching methods are really focused on actually making the form rather than performing mm -hmm. that. You know, they separated the goal. Like, I think you're right, right? If you let someone, they would not listen to you. Oh, this is working. I'm not going <laughs> to. But sometimes I was, it was so instructive and I could, and then as a kid, I couldn't do the movement they wanted. So right. I was like, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. I, I was thinking actually, while you were talking about that yeah, there's a bit of a, it's almost that there, there is a, this conflation actually, I think of two different things, which is the use of verbal instruction. And the other thing is the idea or the, the, the notion that there is one correct technique, right? So, so if you think there is a, an ideal technique, then verbal instruction can be a good way of conveying what that technique is in terms of joint angles and all that sort of good stuff. But um, verbal instruction does not necessarily have to be that. It's like it's almost as if the problem that we have is the is the lurk is the use of verbal instruction to coach a technique rather than the use of verbal instruction. It's almost like the, the the concern from the ecological approach is the package rather than the elements, but it's become we don't like verbal instruction is has become kind of the shorthand maybe. I was yeah, I was just because I, I was just realizing as you were pointing out that that was lurking a little bit under there is this notion of what what's the complaint about verbal instruction is that it's overly prescriptive. Um, but and the other thing I actually I was thinking about as well, of course, and the other concern about verbal instruction just given around a technique or around a form or even used, you know, um, uh, to sort of guide what people are doing. <clears throat> One of the issues has been that uh, the question of rep the representativeness of the training environment then immediately rears its head because, of course, in the game environment, you don't have the coach providing that verbal information to feed into what you're doing with the shape of the thing. So say you're, you know, you're holding a, you know, I don't know holding a hockey stick or shooting a basketball or whatever. If during practice, you were leaning quite heavily on what it was the coach was telling you in terms of where to put your weight or whatever. Um, from a representative design point of view, that's not a good fit for the information that's present in the game context. And so you're not going to expect a lot of successful transfer of ability from the, from the, from the training environment through to the game environment, which is the whole point of training, right? right. Um, yeah. I mean, some of that I think is... <clears throat> I mean, I, I completely agree with that point, and and I think it's it's common to a lot of the the feedback literature as well, right? The augmented feedback literature, where you know one of the things that you try to do during training is you know fade away this extra mm -hmm. information, whether it's from the coach or whether it's from or even constraint. Like even if you manipulate the design environment in some physical way, presumably that's not going to carry over mm -hmm. as well. But you try to sort of um, move them away or wean them away from um, the extra manipulations that you've done so that then it transfers well, right? So I, to me, that that sort of concern would be, is, is I think it's very true in, in terms of it applies to a lot of stuff. Um, but I think there's, there's ways to 
you know, potentially mitigate that serious consequence of, well, I don't have that coach yelling in my ear or whatever. Yeah. Uh, by that, sort of, that's, fun, you know, that's funny, though. Thinking about... Feedback. Yeah, thinking about the fading feedback idea and the idea that you want to give them that initial support early on, right? That's another thing yeah. I hear from coaches is that they want to be able to tell the novice what to right. do, right? They want to be able to use verbal instruction in order to get them into the ballpark. And I was thinking, you know, I, you know, I run experiments on coordination um, um, stuff, you know, finger wiggling and all that sort of good old-fashioned yeah. Kelso stuff. <clears throat> and I've got, a, I've got a feedback method that I use that isn't, prescriptive in the sense that it tells you what to do but it's sort of it's it's real-time feedback about whether you're moving at the required coordination and I fade it right I started out with a nice big bandwidth to get you into the ballpark and narrow it down in order to get you better so <clears throat> and it works gangbusters like that doing it doing it like I have to I have to I have to shape my constraint over time like a funnel right, right? um so that intuition is like that's clearly a thing and we're all worried about it and it does keep coming up um but it's interesting that it connects to the <clears throat> again there's that sense when in thinking about it that way of you want to use the verbal instructions at the beginning and then wean them off the verbal instruction that's an interesting idea all by itself thinking about mm. how to use verbal instruction <clears throat> and, thinking, yeah. and whacking time into that question of how you use verbal instruction mm. yeah this, this is a comment i get a lot from coaches is you know, I like the idea of self-organization and constraints and stuff, but how do I give them, you know, the word I get a lot is the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. I think it's exactly what you're talking about. What's the basic coordination profile? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like an mm -hmm. example I use, like, it, like think about setting a volleyball. Mm -hmm. Not only is there a, 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 optimal, a way that experts tend to do that, there's rules about what's legal, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so sure. does someone define that on their own without giving them any, <laughs> like they won't because they wouldn't know the rules. Like, they need to know those constraints. But I guess what, do you, hmm. do you think, is verbal instruction the best way to go with yeah. conveying that? You know, I, I think observation might be a little, you know, is that because we all know the kind of dangers of, you know, we get into the internal, and if Nick were here, he would, you know, the internal, external, cues yeah. issue and things but what, what do you think is it um do you think that's a good place to start to just give people the basic form or and, and and do you think that we need to do that i think you you would agree that we kind of need to put people in the right ballpark maybe <laughs> to start off with mm. yeah. yeah i mean i i think it you know you know, it comes back to to what context specifically we're talking about, right? So there mm -hmm. there are certain cases where I mean, I, again, I'm thinking about like, like sort of what Andrew was referring to, especially early on skill mm -hmm. learning. Um, you know, yeah. the, the things that verbal instruction to me have going for it is um, it's cheap and it doesn't require mm -hmm. technology, right? So it's mm -hmm. sort of like there's um, uh, lots of contexts where that sort of even a small nudge towards the right pattern might help. I think, that, yeah, it's definitely, I would say it complements uh, observation, right? So like, yeah, definitely you want to have an idea of what, and then let's say it's whatever, if it's throwing and somebody has an idea of what overhand throwing looks like before they start. Uh, but as things progress, I think it might be helpful for verbal instructions occasionally to sort of just nudge them towards uh, certain parts of the, the workspace so that they're exploring more efficiently. That's sort of where I think verbal instructions really have uh, values. Just this, you know, they're they're cheap and they're they're quick. You don't have to have a whole lot of things to to work at, which which I think in a in a field setting is really uh, helpful when you're whatever watching forty students how to do something. <laughs> well, you know, that that helps a lot. But if you don't know if you if you don't have a good reason to guide their attention one way or another, or just to, to make them pay attention to one thing over another, right? This is one of the things that comes up is is that from an ecological point of view, using using verbal instruction without some sort of guiding set of principles can actually harm much more than it can help. So you've got this chance of helping, but actually the odds are pretty good that if you don't if you if you don't have a reason to Give a particular kind of verbal instruction, then you're actually going to you're going to actively harm the skill acquisition process. So again, for me, it keeps coming back to um, it's like you know, like the discussion last week about you know why pick a theory, and you know you've got to you have to kind of have a reason to be doing something one way rather than another way, and you, you also have to know what that reason is. 
or else you just end up doing that thing or that thing because you think that that's the way to go, but you don't know why it works and you don't have an understanding of what to do when it fails. And yeah, it's like, again, so maybe to pivot and think a bit more productively, right? You're clearly right, right? Verbal instruction is cheap. Everyone can do it. Everyone can understand it. So now the question becomes, how do you do it properly? Or how do you do it in a way that is just going to maximize the, the, the odds that it's actually going to be helpful? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, I had a sort of note in there, sort of, you know, talking about exactly this point. Right? So what <laughs> what do you give verbal instructions about is, I think, a separate ball game from, you know, are they useful? Yeah, uh, sure. Absolutely. And, and I certainly agree with the point that it, it can be done badly, right? So it can be, mm -hmm. and, and, and this is where I think this distinction between, you know, biomechanics and coordination really comes in, right? So you can, you can measure all these things, whether it's angles or forces or moments or whatever <clears throat> but i don't think uh you know if you sort of prescribe or subscribe to the idea that your you know underlying control is low dimensional right it's not mm -hmm. that the brain is controlling every joint angle independently and one doing some kind of motion mm -hmm. then trying to find that you know underlying thing that mm -hmm. to give verbal instructions about i think is 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 definitely something Worth considering. I mean, my, my sense is like, you know, expert coaches may have an intuitive sense for what it is. I mean, I'm thinking about things like, you know, you know, stepping with the wrong leg, for example, right? You, sure, you step sure. with the wrong mm -hmm. leg when you're throwing it, it messes up your hip rotations and it messes up everything sort of beyond mm -hmm. the chain. And so just switching that thing from, well, you're stepping with the wrong leg fixes a lot of things, right? Without having to give them instruction about every little thing that, that needs to be fixed down the chain. But and again, I, I my sense is people have some sort of intuitive one. At least the good coaches have an intuitive understanding of it. But but I'm absolutely uh, I agree with the point that we really need to find a better way of talking about language in terms of yeah. what the verbal instructions need to be about. I'm I'm sort of again I, I I agree with the view that you know it's probably not biomechanical variables yeah. at least the way they are typically. Mm -hmm analyze it's it's i don't think you know trying to give instruction about every possible angle in the body is necessarily helpful i think there's some something low dimensional there in a task that that can suddenly <laughs> flip a lot of things if you got it right yeah yeah i think those are the great points i think you're right i think from the kind of the theoretical perspective it's more what should we be yeah saying cuz you're right like once we decide say we decide a player's too upright and they need to bend their knees more. I, I think we'd all agree, like you were suggesting, right? If saying that you need to bend your knees exactly 45 degrees and giving, so it wouldn't, but we could do the same thing with an analogy, mm -hmm. fix, right? So I think we've got a good yeah. understanding and, and Nick, obviously Nick's book goes on this and then Gabby Wolf's work on how, if we decide what we want to change, I think we have a good feeling of how to do it the right way. Um, in the you know the way, but you're right, the key is what, <laughs> yeah. you know, how much and, and you're right. I, and I, to me, I always, why, why, why do you want, like your, your description of the wrong foot is like a perfect way to think about it. I think, what do you, what, you know, you're breaking the kinetic chain, you're not getting as much velocity. So I think we lose the why a lot of times mm -hmm. and we get these traditional passed down orthodoxies about how to move. Mm -hmm. and we forget why um, mm -hmm. we're doing it anymore. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, where are you going to, yeah. Yeah, I think lots of things. I think, you know, a couple of conversations over the last couple of days in which <clears throat> that theme of <clears throat> losing losing track of the why we do things, mm -hmm. uh, being, a, being a thing that some coaches and academics who, who overlap into the coaching world in various kinds of ways, it's a thing that's really on their minds, I think. Um, yeah, so it just so happened, like, that just happens to have come up a few times in a few different conversations for me. And I think, and again, that feeds back to, um what you know one of the things i like about taking an ecological approach is that you tend to by the but you, you tend to fall into it on purpose rather than by default and when you fall when you come into it on purpose you tend to to have engaged with the why in order to arrive at the ecological approach and that's just sort of for historical reasons because we're, we're not the default right we have to you have to switch to us right <clears throat> i think one of the nice side effects of that is that ecologically minded people think about the why all the time and that's what and so we we know that it's a question and we think it's important um and i tend to think that it is important because then it's because the why like the, the why of how, why you do that thing rather than another thing is is 
it's it's an important part of coaching, I think. And I think one of the one of the frustrations around verbal instruction is definitely this issue of the of of the why do you do it and what are you guiding? You know, what what is it that's guiding you to to say one thing rather than another thing that doesn't appear? And and <clears throat> one, you, do you know what? One of the very legitimate um, uh, limits right now of the ecological approach that people call out is we don't have a we don't really have a good language for it. You know. You can say that verbal instruction is a constraint. I mean, that's obviously how we would go about using it. <clears throat> but we kind of, the, the the research world doesn't really yet have a good, solid way, ecological way of thinking about what speech and language are in terms of what they can do to guide action and skill acquisition mm. and various kinds of other things. It's, it's coming, like it's been developing. There's people getting interested and it's one of those things that's happening. But I also think that the, his sort of historically, I think the, the coaching world is is kind of lagging us by about 15, 20 years, not for any bad reason, just because it took about that long for the ideas ideas to start percolating through. And they're doing what we did 15, 20 years ago, which is picking off the low fruit and, and, and manipulating the physical environment where you can get big effects and you can really kind of understand what's going on. Something like understanding what kind of constraint a speech act is is a really difficult question ecologically. My bet is we, we can we can cope with it, <clears throat> but it's a big ask and we don't have good questions yet. So that's the other thing is that um, it's a very legitimate challenge that we get thrown at us is, well, then how do we do it? And I've got some ideas, but I don't have a lot of, I don't have the same level of evidence base for manipulating verbal instruction the way I do a physical environment to provide a certain kinds of affordances. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really big, it's a very legitimate question that we can't quite put our money where our mouth is right now. Um, yeah. um, but it's, I think, I think the time is clearly right, right? There's clearly a hunger for, for an answer to the question, which just means that we need to start cracking on. I, I mean, I know that people are, and that there have been sort of people are starting to think about this, which is great, but, but it's a hard problem. Yeah. I would almost, the part of it for me is it's kind of like a frame of reference problem, right? Uh, a verbal instruction is explicit, mm -hmm. you know, uh, often third person mm -hmm. uh, verbal description. And really in the ecological approach, we kind of believe you don't use any of that <laughs> to control your movement. So how mm -hmm. do I convert? And, then, you know, and that's what designing good cues and things is all about, right? How do I yeah. tap into this other system? But I, right, I, I don't think we have a good, I don't know, framework uh, for what exactly we're trying to achieve. We're not trying to make your body exactly aligned in a certain way what are we uh, trying to do exactly i think we're a bit vague on that i fully admit <laughs> yeah i mean sabrina and to a certain lesser extent sabrina and i have written some papers trying to just start to articulate that framework and start to divvy up the ground and i think we're making sort of some sort of progress but um yeah like it's it's super early days and it's not mm -hmm. at all clear how to do that i was thinking as well about like you know um uh, what you were saying, Rajiv, about finding the, the, the you know, what's the, what's, how could, how could you verbally guide attention to the low dimensional solution that's actually being operated on, given that one of the things, one of the reasons why it's taken so long for us to identify those is that they're not part of our normal sort of experience of how we're moving. We don't conceptualize and we're not consciously aware of our movements, I don't think, kind of in those terms. And so again, like how do you direct someone's attention to that when they've never considered that, that that's how their body moves, you know? And analogy you uh, rob you were talking about you know i think some coaches as they try and find ways of using movement to not overload with specific irrelevant detail but still to get you into a useful ballpark uh, you know people want to use things like analogies move like a tree move like a wave move your arm like this um you know pretend you're about to jump whatever <clears throat> again that that i think starts heading in your direction Raji, but it starts heading towards that low dimensional solution um, yeah. but, again, but, but again, right now, there's no good guiding principle for telling you like which, which one of those things to, which, what's the right analogy? Because of course, all the analogies are to experiences and some of those experiences just don't map onto how the thing actually goddamn works, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I have a somewhat slightly different view on, mm -hmm. on, you know, like this sort of dialogue between research and, and coaching. <clears throat> Um, I think I'm, I'm sort of the view of, I see them as parallel tracks rather than sequential uh, in mm -hmm. terms of, well, the research needs to go first before it sort of filters into coaching. Uh, sure. Yeah, um, sure. And, and, and I sort of, I mean, I think in, in it's it's always worked that way 
historically as well, right? I mean, people came up with the Fosbury flop before <laughs> people talked about center of mass being, you know, lower than the bar or whatever. I think th there's definitely, I mean, I see the, them as parallel. And like I said, a lot of things, like we talked about this idea of a low dimensional uh, thing <clears throat> that people are manipulating. I, I mean, my sense is people have some intuitive understanding of how that works and maybe not be sort of quantifiable in the way we would like. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there is definitely stuff that, you know, potentially can can cross boundaries. So I I, I kind of think of them as parallel. I, I I would, you know, again being a model learning researcher myself, I would really hesitate if everybody were dependent on advances in model learning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, would be. that is a that is a fair <laughs> point. I, I, yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. The, the, the Olympic sports would be uh, <laughs> cracking, <laughs> um, uh, reaching, <laughs> grasping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You tell, you tell some academic they've got a deadline for the next Olympics, and it's just like, oh, I just have another couple of months. I've got a lot of marking to do. Sorry, you know? might, yeah. we might be able to add skateboarding in about 100 years. <laughs> we get some slight intuition about it. Yeah. No, I think that's a, that's really good. So yeah. going back to you guys, just so kind of for people listening, the low dimensional, you're talking about mm. things like describing, like in running, people have a certain phase. We can... Okay. We can describe a really complex activity on a really a simple uh, a simple variable like the relationship between your phase of your legs. But so you're running some different pattern. How do you convey to someone you need to change the phase relationship of your like? Right. I think you're right. I I completely agree with you. I I think they're I think they're connected in parallel. I would say too. I think the experiential mm -hmm. knowledge of coaches figures out these kind of things. Um, in a very different way than we would, <laughs> you know, right. without, without having, you know, then we'd, we'd want to prove it and, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and, and test it. And so I think there, we could definitely learn from both. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's where, I mean, they have the advantage in the domain expertise, right? I mean, yeah, it, at least in the context of one particular task, they know what works, they know what doesn't, it may not, that knowledge may not be generalizable to other kinds of model learning tasks, but I think, Having that, you know, like you said, the experiential knowledge of a single domain um, often cues them to certain things that a mm. researcher looking from a much farther view may not be able to sort of, you know, get at in terms of like an experiment sort of thing. Um, mm. But, but yeah, me, it's important to, to talk to each other. That makes me think of a question that I don't know the answer to, and that is, <clears throat> um, do, are, there, are there good examples of coaches going from one sport to another sport? And doing quite well at both of them. They must, uh, presumably. The, I was just thinking about your issue right, about like their expertise being contained to actually a fairly particular domain. Um, I'm just. I just started thinking about does 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 expertise in verbally instructing and coach uh, and coaching athletes at f in football help in roller skating? I don't. I don't know. Yeah. I, I would certainly. I would certainly think there would some that would be on want to argue that. There's basic the fundamentals are are similar like running running in one sport's the same as running like uh, Franz would want to say that you know he yeah. can he, and uh, you know Dan Paff who coaches <laughs> lots of different sports so you're right but I think you, you know so they're basic like things like that I would say yeah there's coaches cross bounder but you very see a soccer coach go to basketball right I I don't think there would be it would be interest that's an interesting question. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I, 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 my, my first thought was similar to yours, Rob, in terms of yeah. there's certain commonalities, like, you know, whatever, throwing sports may have some commonalities, yeah. and things like that, but but completely a different domain might be I mean, might be harder, I think. Yeah, and I so I think, hmm. you know, so I think we've, we've kind of established, so I've had a couple uh, comments in uh, that you know, it, it's it's is it fair to describe verbal prescription as necessarily prescriptive? No, I think we're saying that <laughs> it doesn't have to be. No, um, um, but I think what we're saying is not prescriptive, but you know, setting boundaries or you know, kind of pushing people in. In I think that's what you were kind of thinking, Rajiv, right? Kind of a directed rather than prescriptive, maybe is a better yeah. word. And, and, yeah, and there's also this other kind of instruction that seems to have. You know, the, people don't talk about it as much, but um, but Carl Newell and Les Carlton they did a lot lot of work on these this idea of what's called transition information, right? So it's it's not simply telling them what the endpoint is, but sort of taking into account where they are and what they need to do 
to move to the next uh, level, which I think is sort of fits very nicely with this idea of knowing the intrinsic dynamics to some extent, right? You know sort of where they are and what they need to do to move from there to the next point rather than just say, hey, here's the endpoint. This is what the endpoint is. And I think there's there's at least a few studies there. Um, and I think I uh, remember Les Carlton's work on throwing um, where they used the, um, the developmental scale of throwing in terms of, you know, there's a progression of a very mature form to, to what mm-hmm. we talk about mature form. And using that as a way of saying, well, if you're at stage four, then your real instruction is, you know, X. Whereas if you're in stage seven, then maybe to move to eight, you need a completely different set of instructions. So it's a, I think it's a nice way of thinking about instructions, again, more than prescriptive, is it can also sort of uh, take account of where you are currently and then move you to the next step. So which I think fits nicely again with uh, yeah, yeah. I, I really like that idea too, and I, I, mean, I think it's something we just. I also connect that with kind of um, Michael's and Jacob's information for learning. So it's kind of like telling you about the trajectory you're on, rather than your your performance, yeah. right? It's, it's how you're moving through this. It's a really nefarious, a kind of a not nefarious, a nebulous concept yeah. that we're still kind of understanding. But I think it's a really nice idea. Could you give me a more, slightly more specific example, Rajiv? I don't know that I'm familiar with this work. I'm just trying to... So, um, the, again, the paper I, I remember most is one where they were um, teaching people to throw with their non-dominant hand, right? So mm-hmm. it's just, you know, one of those things which, which takes a long time to do oh, yeah. reasonably well. <laughs> and they were using this idea of uh, transition information, meaning um, your goal is not to describe what the endpoint is, which would be mm-hmm. you know, some instructions you could say, well, here's the mature form go for it, right? Which is sort oh, of where see. they are at the moment. Uh, whereas if you are, say, at a stage one where you're, say, not stepping, right? Um, then you would say, okay, well, you need to move to step two in okay. order to do X. Whereas somebody who, say, was at step whatever, four or five, I don't remember the stages. Yeah, yeah sure. But, but the yeah. the instructions towards the goal vary as a function of where you are. So it's not simply a it's prescriptive what... account like what people would normally uh, do. Yeah, There's okay. Maybe you'll go for it. But you sort of yeah, tailor uh, the instructions based what's on the, what's 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 the one thing to get you to the next place? Yeah, exactly. Sort of like you know, what's what's your weakest link, sort of thing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, that's useful. The example I, I like to use. I don't know if this is quite what he had had in mind, but um, to mind, it's not verbal. It's more the so in the one of the constraints we use for we use in baseball pitching is a connection ball. So if if a if pitcher's arm is separating from their body too early. Mm-hmm. Um, when they're throwing, it can cause injury. So what you do is you get them to hold a rubber ball under their arm against mm-hmm. their body while they pitch. So their main goal is still to throw the ball at the target. Mm-hmm. But what you want you tell them to do is pitch so that the ball, when it falls out, it goes towards where you throw the ball. Mm-hmm. So if you separate too early, the ball falls and goes sideways. So the direction that ball goes is not feedback about your main task it's mm-hmm. kind of feedback about whether your solution is getting you there <laughs> you know how your solution is is progressing mm-hmm. to solve this problem mm-hmm. so it, that's ca- my kind of best one i can think of but um it is a di- i think it's a really um interesting idea um, yeah so i think we the other idea is, to me i think we can talk about where we'd want to kind of push verbal instruction is is encouraging exploration Right. So Mm -hmm. um, and I've often said, like, one of the things I would like to see more done in the focus of attention literature is kind of tease. So I think explicit uh, external instructions are good because they're less prescriptive. Right. Mm -hmm. They don't move your body this way. They say push the ground away this way, which you can do in more. But they also, depending on how you word them, they encourage their you know they encourage you to kind of try different things when you if you just mm-hmm. focus on the outcome so mm-hmm. yeah so i don't know i think there's lots of different ways that we can rethink of verbal instruction um getting people you know pointing people to information you mm-hmm. know mm-hmm. look at the you know I, I don't know look at the gaps <laughs> in the players and you know things like that um so and I, I, think, I think that that's one thing i was uh also you know yeah. sort of been thinking about is this the, the internal versus external focus, I think, is a nice uh, mm-hmm. line of work. Um, one thing that, you know, like like you just mentioned, that fits in well with that problem is the problem of, of the redundancy itself, right? There's lots of things that can happen at the internal level that can all lead to the same 
external outcome. Mm -hmm. So it it would be nice to see whether, um, like like you said, whether the external focus um, not only encourages, say, more exploitation of redundancy, but then somebody could also come in and say, well, maybe it, you know, in some cases at least, it could potentially lead you to a, a again a suboptimal solution that's good enough for now but not good enough for later so mm -hmm. in that case the internal focus even though it may affect your performance now could potentially be a you know better solution in the long term i don't know if that's true but i mean it, i think it might it brings about the idea that the the internal and external focus are are connected by the by the redundancy in the task and again most mm -hmm. tasks we study don't have that much redundancy uh, mm -hmm. which is you know again something that we probably need to fix as a field yeah, um, yeah. but yeah. i think it's uh you know, one one potential factor that mediates that internal external focus uh, studies. Huh. Yeah, that, that's another question I have, and maybe this gets into some of the work you do, RG two and rehab kind of whether we can do. Uh, to me, I have real doubts that we can do this. Sh like, there's a lot of this pressure to give short term gains. Mm -hmm. Like, like all, look at all the classic contextual interference studies, right? Yeah. <laughs> You do learn faster if you cheat right, and give people a solution you know, and don't randomize things. But we, the idea is we like to believe it's not as good in the long run. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a temptation for people who want to do that. And then but I, I have my kind of doubts whether it's possible, how effectively you can switch from giving a solution to switching to letting people take advantage mm -hmm. of redundancy. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you guys think about that. Yeah. Because uh, I, I get the pressure. That coaches yeah. and physicians have of, I only have so long to work with these people. I can't let them try yeah. everything, right? Mm -hmm. I need I need to give them something. So I totally understand that pressure, but I worry about, you know, how you're going to transition from that if if you really want to do something else. Yeah, that's it. Taking the longer term view mm -hmm. actually is really important. So um, it's funny, like you know, and thinking about things that we do academically in the field. You know, we study learning. You know, we we bring you in and give you. 50 trials of practice over 20 minutes and, and call that learning, right? Um, so, it, yeah, no, it turns out to be really important uh, to study retention, for example, over longer, over reasonably long time yeah. scale. So, you know, because actually the whole contextual interference and the variability of training sort of stuff doesn't show up until later, right? And that's the whole point is that you've got to take that longer view and then you've got to make the decision about which one of those things you actually want. Do you know, what? actually, I think about this, I've been thinking about this a lot in the context of teaching research methods to first year psychology, undergraduate, <laughs> which, was a, which was a thing I used to do. And then I actually, I, I finally realized uh, a couple of years ago, I hadn't actually ever put this together explicitly, but I realized I was doing it in a very constraints based way. Because uh, of course I was, I was like, how do I, how do I think people learn, right? Um, and again, because, you know, when you're, and there's that, especially, you know, especially for something like stats, right? There's that sense that people are starting at zero and you have to just give them some knowledge. Otherwise, you'll never get them moving. Um, and I don't, yeah, I've come to the conclusion, I don't actually think that's true. I think you have to just, you know, you have to set scenes and you have to give them things to do. And I'd like, there's ways of doing it. And I'm sort of still kind of thinking about articulating it, but there's just that urge and I like I felt this urge so I used to run these classes they'd be small classes uh, and I'd do this I'd do the same uh, delivery to multiple classes across the week and they'd work in small groups uh, they'd get, I'd give them a little mini lecture at the beginning to set the scene and then they'd go off and do some do some work and I never gave them lists of step-by-step -step instructions on how to use SPSS but I taught them how to go look things up on YouTube and in their textbook right hmm. and even though even sort of where I'm coming from and where what what I think works and how I think stuff works, right? I would be wandering around and taking questions and the students would be nervous and they would want some help and they would want to know how to do something and they were feeling genuinely bad about their inability to do the new thing that they were doing in class that day. And the urge to just tell them the answer yeah. was so strong and I really had to kind of fight it off because I really wanted to help and it, uh, and I had to start finding ways to support them without giving them the answer so that they made it through that little tough period. And it's it's really complicated and it's really hard. So I'm, it's funny, like I'm, I'm, I'm really sympathetic to all those issues that you were just talking about, Rob, and I've just been thinking about them. I'm not a sports coach, but you know what? I've done a lot of teaching over the years and, you know, that we all do that. Um, and I actually think the issues are really much 
they're very similar. Um, and no one's, as far as I can tell, if anybody knows, I'd love to know, nobody's really taken a constraints-led approach to classroom delivery. <laughs> yeah. but, I, but it seems like a really interesting domain, because, especially for, some, for teaching something like research methods or statistics, right? It kind of all exists in language. It doesn't exist in physical activity other than mouse clicking on Jasper or stats or on SPSS or whatever. Um, it seems like a really, really intriguing domain. It's been on my head. I, I, I don't know how to engage with it because it's not my area, but I've been thinking about it as a domain. And then, yeah, all that stuff about the internal and external focus of attention, that literature, again, about this consequence of the way you use verbal instruction, about where you guide attention, you know, there's just a huge literature on that. And again, it's a, it seems to be a great place to go looking for ideas, but also as you were identifying, there's a bunch of stuff still to do in that domain. Some very, really important questions. I loved the idea, Rajiv, about like using more, you, you know, uh, uh, doing focus of attention stuff with tasks that provide more opportunity for redundancy and, and all that kind of stuff and looking to see, you know, whack some UCM on it, right? Not do they move that way versus that way, but, you know, does the good variability Right. Out my way the bad do they start showing do, do different instructions facilitate not doing the thing but doing the thing in that flexible adaptive way that we think is the right way is the best way to do it for and so on yeah sorry mm -hmm. that was just me all, <laughs> that, that was all the stuff that was happening in my life, <laughs> you guys talking. i just wanted to get it out there so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. maybe going back to, to, to your point robin about to rehab i think one of mm -hmm. the things um there was this article i remember maybe a few months ago, maybe a year ago, um, on, on Lance Klusner and, you know, the cricket uh, batter who, who you know, is a very big hitter, right? So he's sort of known for his big hitting. And um, they asked him how he trained, and he said, well, I use a ball machine. And, you know, that sort of took me by surprise. But, like, I mean, that's <laughs> the worst way to do it. Um, but, but one of the things that, I mean, he, he had a quite sort of nuanced view. He said, uh, yes, there may be other techniques that are helpful, but none of them gets me the number of mm -hmm. you know practice trials that i can get in a ball machine right which is which is something we we always sort of control for in the experiment so i i think that's one of the reasons why translation from sort of the motor learning experiment world to mm -hmm. to the real world is is complicated mm -hmm. because the things you know like you said we only have a certain amount of time and you know would i rather have four trials of the best possible learning method or 400 <laughs> trials of something that works yeah. reasonably. I mean, we don't think about these compromises in, in the experiment world, but this is exactly the kind of question that, you know, a coach needs to be focused on. And I think it's, you know, which is why I think, you know, we also need to be thinking more about things like, you know, effect sizes, right? What What's really, you know, is, is for example, if one repetition gives you a much bigger effect size than fine tuning all the, the perfect, you know, recipe for motor <laughs> learning, you know, maybe it's it's better to even uh, skip that phase. So, I mean, I don't know yeah. if that's true, but I, I, yeah. I just feel like that's something that we ignore in our experiments because we tightly control for how many trials they do and, yeah. you know, yeah, and those kinds of things. Yeah, I think that's a point Carl's made in a number of papers is we yeah. we hardly, if ever, that really did study coordination in the research, right. right? People show up already with the basic pattern. Like, I even, I can think of golf experiments I've done where I've used kind of a constraint self-organization approach, but someone shows up that doesn't know anything about golf, how to stand. What do I do? I tell them, right? yeah. <laughs> I, I tell them what you got to do there. Like I totally, yeah. I don't let them come up with the basic, you know, we very rarely take a, which was what coaches have to do, right? They have yeah. people, especially with kids and never try things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's funny as well as, um, yeah, you're right. Like we we don't study the process of getting the basic coordinative structure very much. And it's funny, like one of the th one of the things that finally made me realize that was that um, the the uh, Jacobs and Michaels uh, 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 direct learning paper came out. What is it? Two thousand and seven. Mm -hmm. Like. That's, you know, we always think we've been talking about learning and development and EJ Gibson was doing all her cool stuff and, you know, people, you know, Karen Adolph does great developmental work and there's all this kind of stuff. But I suddenly realized that in 2007 was the first kind of ecological way of thinking about how you go from zero to something, which is, it's a, you know, well, not, you know, not quite zero, but how do you, how do you, how do you kind of get in the game? 
like how do you begin the process of attuning right how do you begin that process we always get people who are some way into that process which is what yeah what you were just saying but it's it then becomes that's the problem is like how do you how do you how do you how do you make your first throw how do you make your first golf swing how do you make your first whatever right right yeah. and how do you make your first golf swing so that it's a golf swing rather than a baseball bat swing right you know right. Um, yeah. if you pick up that club, what makes you do one? Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's funny. It seems like we can do it either way. Like with the initial start, like the example I always like to use is running. Like, I don't think there's very many of us that had any explicit verbal instruction about how to run <laughs> from any, from any, we have yeah. a lot of evolutionary time, evolutionary yeah. time scale stuff going on there. Same with throwing. Right. And it's like, yeah. that's why, right. Running is, yeah. is, is well except that you have you do have to learn how to run right so one of my favorite uh uh <laughs> if you're ever bored and you've got a small child that's just learned how to walk right this is like karen adolf stuff you stick them on the top of a ramp so that they pick up too much speed and so that their walking is no longer a stable coordination pattern for for locomotion down that and um normally what happens you know when you're a, a little bit older is that you then transition into running as you increase the speed but there's that point where little kids have learned how to walk, but they have not yet learned how to run. And when their walking disintegrates, they fall over and it's hilarious, right? But that's like, so there is like, like at some point, like running is sufficiently different from walking that at some point you do it for the first time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think that the point about the complexity of the task, um, I don't I mean, it, it's, We've we've been saying that for quite a number of years now. <laughs> um, it just seems to be I don't know like for for an academic environment, it just seems too difficult to manage. I think you know this could be one of those things that you know it could be like a team science project, right? So not not one lab that does yeah. everything, but you know maybe something that because I think we need to fix this at some point. I think keeping saying that you know we're not addressing the coordination aspect. Um, mm -hmm. To me, miss. I mean, that is a big part of the picture, uh, especially if, you know, like like you know, at the beginning, Rob saying if we're not thinking about the the motivation and the other sort of psychological aspects. Well, then the the main skill happens sort of early on in that phase. So sort of ignoring that is to our own peril. I mean, that's why I'm really excited about all the motor abundance stuff, all the you know uncontrolled manifold and all the stochastic optimal control and TNC, all those analyses, all those analysis methods are, I think. Potentially, I'm really intrigued by their potential to give us a window so that you could study a fairly complicated movement but reduce it down to a manageable, understandable coordinative structure in the maths, right? Yeah. Um, but also then you could start doing manipulations, right? So what do the kinematics look like it, when you're tired, right? Versus, and it's not just, oh, they moved slower, but they produced they they were more rigid they were less flexible they were less adaptive yeah. right and again it's that it's that emphasis of studying process rather than outcome and that's but again that's why i've been super excited about all these methods because i think that um you know there are finally some 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 people have shown up and thrown some fairly heavy duty maths at a, at a very at a problem that needed some heavy duty maths and that was never going to come from the biomechanists and the psychologists like me but now that, that now that those things exist I'm really intrigued by their potential for to and but I but I I think you're right. I think we as a field need to see their potential in those analyses and figure out how to use them properly. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing at the moment with a I, I, I was saying I think before we started, I've got a big a big uh, 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 data set of motion capture data from a throwing experiment that a couple of years ago, and I'm collaborating with colleagues up the road at Carnegie who know about UCM and all these things. It's taken us a while to get going for lots of reasons, um, but we're at the point now where we're starting to do the UCM. And kind of for me, I'm structuring the project to kind of like we're doing a fairly sort of bog standard UCM kind of thing, you know, fairly standard kind of analysis. But then I also want to start thinking about more, you know, how to connect uh, a UCM analysis that is, you know, the organization of the variability in the movement relative to a task goal. What happens if you quantify that task goal, not as the orientation of an of, a, of your hand, but relative to some affordance property? Yeah. I, don't, I like I. I don't yet know how to make this work. I see the potential of it, but I'm just thinking about, yeah, if we, 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 you could start doing things like this and we could start asking questions like this. And I suspect 
those are more interesting questions and answers for the more complicated movements like that happen in sports. I think I suspect some of the sometimes coaches are a bit suspicious of us. I saw this great slide on Twitter the other day. It was like the, the slide one, slide two conundrum. <laughs> You know, slide one, you know, humans are extraordinarily capable of doing all kinds of crazy, amazing things. Slide two, we measured this by having them press a button 40 seconds. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so, so they they see us. I think people see us and they see the big claims in the introduction section and then they see the, the, yeah. the button pressing task and the methods. And I think they kind of, you know, yeah, anyway. So it was just, it yeah. got me thinking, Rajiv, again about just, yeah, we need to update. Yeah little bit to get into this yeah. and i and think we, some of yeah some of your work rajiv you're doing looking yeah. at like task space and null space variability and how that predicts uh, unfortunately you're not getting like simple answers like <laughs> this predicts yeah. you know <laughs> um, but i think you're starting i think that's one it's it's like interesting <laughs> i think the biggest thing we so i think going back i think we know how there's a lot of information about how to use verbal instructions that are consistent with ecological approach and stuff. Yeah. I think with the biggest thing we on the research side is when, you know, yeah. when to step in, mm -hmm. what should we be instructing about is still yeah. the big open. And I think, so can you tell us a little bit about that, that work, right? So some of the things you've been finding, I know, uh, looking at how kind of variability relates to learning and do you see like a path to that To I know it's a long way to be able to say, you know, this is, not productive <laughs> variability <laughs> this is or, or, or what do you think about that yeah i, I think um so so the task that i use goes from for goes yeah, from one go, to two degrees of freedom right it's, <laughs> it's not <laughs> like the, the minimal jump you could make to make it redundant um uh, but i think you know just like like andrew was saying i think there's some benefits to keeping it relatively simple just then rather than jump on all the way through without without a full understanding of you know again mm -hmm. Just going beyond task outcomes, I think you know, it's sort of one of my goals, at least, is to understand why. So, um, so we have this task where um, people are are doing a throwing task, so they are like doing this. Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of like a, um, you know, you're sliding this puck on on a on a virtual table, and you have to get to a particular target. So you have to throw it at a particular velocity, and land it on the target, you know, as as close to the target as possible. Um, the the twist here is that. Um, Participants are actually using both hands here. So the, the puck is sort of dependent on the sum of the speeds of the two hands. So that means, you know, that gives this redundancy because you could use, you know, more of your right hand, less of your left hand, sort of 50-50 if you want, if you're equal, and then the other way as well. So there's lots of variability. Uh, even for the same task performance, you could have lots of, of movement variability. So one of the things, you know, we've been playing around with this, um, you know, because people are doing this on a robot, we can now apply forces that that perturb their movement. So we've been trying to think about, uh, you know, from this general idea of well, there's you know one component of variability that's bad because it's creating errors, and the other component is good because that's where you have the the exploration of of the different solutions. Uh, we're trying to get that from a from a causal standpoint, right? So in the sense of if I make you you know, now I'm applying forces with the robot and I push you to different parts of the workspace, are you better off at learning uh, compared to somebody who hasn't seen those uh, solutions? And, and you know, like Rob said, um, it doesn't seem to be simple in the sense of, you know, one side is good and one side's bad. Um, what, what we've often found is um, the amplitude of the variability matters a lot. So it's, again, the sort of variability is good, variability is bad is probably, you know, mm -hmm. as you all probably know, it's, it's probably too simple. Uh, how much is is clearly um, an important factor. And the other thing that we found in our, our most recent work, we're trying to get the, the preprint out soon, is um, that the, the variability that you introduce, um, how it fits with sort of the existing structure of variability also seems to matter. So if your existing structure of variability is along a certain dimension and you introduce a variability along a different direction, um, that seems to hurt more even if the task performance is not affected. So it's sort of there seems to be lots of caveats there in terms of how we understand, even in that simplest task, how uh, variability plays into uh, learning. Yeah. But I think that's a really interesting approach to uh, try and understand these. Yeah, cool. um, yeah. Mm. Um, I had a couple question from a couple of people about 
you know, using verbal instructions to direct people to affordances. Um, maybe this is more Andrew. Um, the um, to me, it, it it's almost parallels the the. I worry about that the lower dimensional issue to me. It, it, like to me, I would distinguish directing someone's attention versus educating attention, right? So saying mm -hmm. "look at that" is very different than use tau to control your like i don't yeah, think yeah. you can verbally instruct someone to pick up a certain informational variable it, yeah. it's way more complex than that i feel um, like it's like yeah. the explanation issue again it's like yeah. i can tell you to look there versus there but i yeah. can't like there's limits on what i can tell you to do in terms of the actual execution or engagement with that point in space um but yeah, I mean, you have to be looking in the right place, obviously, so you can guide. People, <laughs> yeah, you know, you weren't, you, you know, you just weren't looking at the right place. Well, I mean, it's looking as I'm already, I'm already conflating attention with vision, right? And it's just, mm. just that automatic move. Like, um, it gets even worse when you're trying to think about attending with other modalities and other sensory systems. Um, how do you know when they're not doing it? Right? Am I listening to that thing behind me while I'm looking in the? And, and you know, how, yeah. yeah. But yeah, like I don't think you can. I don't think you can verbally. I don't think you can verbally tell someone how to affect an affordance. I don't think that makes. Uh, like I don't think you can. Uh, you can. You can direct them in the right sort of uh, uh, to, to look there rather than there. But the actual execution. And then the, actually, the other thing is that even looking in the same place, you might not see the affordance, right? So if I was, you know, I, I would think, think about David Beckham or you know, uh, pick your favorite footballer, right? They see affordances for uh, and opportunities to place balls in all kinds of interesting places. That if I was literally standing in the exact same spot and literally looking in the exact same place, I will literally not see what they are seeing, right? Um, so again, it's like you can point them in the right direction, but then absolutely you have to actually, yeah, that's you've got to keep them coupled, right? You've got to then do the, you've actually got to engage with the thing before you can actually, you know. There's a weird sense in which you can literally look at something and not see an affordance, even though it's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. especially you know, complex, so, right? Yeah, I I think that you can you know some people are saying you can direct people you know to, to certain areas, certain you know look at the spaces, look at the distance. But I think it's it's again it's not it's a different <laughs> I you know frames of reference is probably like, it's different language. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, yeah. Look at look at you know look at the gaps versus look at the players. That's really hard. Yeah, like, I like for me anyway. I like I like. It's funny I think about that because I think it's a sensible thing to do, right? If you're like because the gaps are the interesting thing for you. That's the thing you want to coordinate and control your behavior with respect to is the changing gap. But what does it mean to look at a gap to pay attention to a gap? Like that's again like that's an interesting. It's a, it seems like a really easy thing to say. Mm -hmm. And you can just kind of say it, and you think that you might be able to look at the gap, but like and. I sort of, if I think about it for slightly more than three seconds, I start, that's an awfully odd thing to ask someone to do. And I wonder, I wonder what my verbal instruction has actually made them do. Yeah. But that, yeah. that was a particular favorite of mine. Because I, it's an interesting I was thinking one. of, you know, maybe something like driving, right? I mean, where a majority of what we learn is through verbal instruction, right? I mean, there's not a whole lot of other way. I mean, unless you're in a driving simulator, I guess you could do things, but most of us don't learn in a driving simulator. And and things like this, right, where you know you have to merge onto another lane. I mean, you're you're perceiving the gaps, but you don't, you know, you, you get instructions like, you know, make sure that car in the mirror is, you know, beyond this thing. I mean, you, you get some information that potentially helps you identify it. After a while, you're not really thinking about those terms when you're merging into yeah. another lane. But you know, it could be these some of these instructions don't have the content in terms of the affordance, but, you know, potentially by way of how they're structured could help you pick up some of it. Uh, well, I think yeah. I thought a lot about it. Like I got my driver's license quite late, actually. Like I've only, I've only been driving for 10 years or so. And so like, I'm, so I thought a lot about it while I was getting instructions about what it was I was learning because, you know, I'm me. And yeah, no, I like that one's really, I always think about the one where, um, you learn to go uh, uh, through a roundabout in the UK, um, and how the my driving instructor could was telling me no, don't go yet because that car's going to turn. I'm like, but how? How? God, I'm like, I'm looking at the same car and I can't tell if it's about to keep coming round or whatever because he hasn't got his bloody blinkers on. Um, 
and then of course you have that moment where you can suddenly see it right because yeah, you, yeah. But, but it's interesting i was thinking about like all of all the verbal instruction that the that the driver gave me was all about directing my attention to to do like and, and it was also but it was also directing my attention to look at a certain place but also to do a certain thing with respect to what it was i was i had had my attention because uh, uh, um, of course you know how do you how do you learn how to drive you get out on the road immediately right right yeah so i was thinking about that as well it's like yeah i was I, I, i'm looking for that gap but not only am i looking for that gap but i'm actually I'm, or keeping an eye on that car, but I'm actually also keeping an eye on that car so that I can pull into the lane in front of or behind it. So that's kind of an inter interesting um, idea, actually. Yeah, no, I think that's a great example, Roger. I know one of the yeah. things sometimes we do, I've seen people do, is try to you know time headway your, your kind of your, your temporal separation to the car in front, which is a complex yeah. Yeah. informational variable. We try to convey it by having you count. Right. Like, it's in like in two, two seconds and what is distance is in meters. Yeah. It's not yeah. in you can do it very like that can give you maybe a, maybe a very crude way, <laughs> but any kind of yeah. skillful thing like race car driving, there's no, like yeah. you can't explicitly <laughs> convey the tangent point of a curve to, to, to <laughs> steer. Like, right. I don't think there's, you, you know, so I, I think I don't know. I, I, I'm. I think that's somewhat useful, but I don't know how much you can get really specific about the information. You know, you have that comes from experience and yeah. interaction. It's still, yeah, it's a great example because, like, yeah. you know, as, as we're sort of identifying, is that it's these verbal instructions are happening in the context of a very coupled perception mm -hmm. action system, and none of the instructions are about gaps or affordances or apertures. But that's what you learn. You know, but the stopping distance one's really interesting, right? I, I've, um, I got really mad at the UK driving test, the, the the actual question test. You know, wanted stopping distances measured in distance, and I had to try and figure it out in terms of time and turn that into a number of meters to, in order to guess which of the ones it was. But I got thinking about that, and I was like, I I kind of had this experience now as a driver that's been doing this. Well, I can kind of perceive that stopping distance, that two seconds. I can see, I, I, I. It's like an affordance, uh, like a what's um, Paige's term, that affordance boundary. I can just, I can just perceive where I am re in re relation to that. Um, but why? Because I got, yeah, all well, that driving instruction about, you know, keep a gap and count those two seconds. And when you do that, you then get placed in the situation where you are explicitly coordinating and controlling your behavior with respect mm -hmm. to the environment. Um, so you're picking up that control information, but you, you're, you got put in that position by by verbal instruction yeah that's a really interesting example and i was just thinking yeah. about in terms of in relation to coaching it's not quite the same that verbal instructions it's not quite delivered in the same at the same timing mm -hmm. i don't know did like while someone is running do coaches yell look at the gap look at that play i don't know does that make sense? Like, I think more yeah. after the fact, kind of like, you know, try to feedback more after what. I, yeah, that that reminded me too. I used to joke about learning to drive in Canada. They 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 test you on really critical things like three point turns and parallel parking. <laughs> but driving in the snow, you figure it out. But <laughs> yeah. we, we do give people this crude verbal instruction, right? When if you ever get into a skid, you steer into the skid. Right, you give right. me the, that won't work. <laughs> I actually we used to play around in a parking lot after hockey practice. That's how I learned how to do it by learning the calorie do, doing it. Yeah, so, yeah, that's a really it's really fine. But yeah, the timing of when so that's something we really didn't touch on, right? So before, kind of what you say before, during reflection, you know, all these kind of different timings as well. So I think we've gone past our time, guys. You maybe any last thoughts you wanna say about this if you have any i think we covered lots of as i expected but i don't know if we kind of i didn't expect us to have concrete answers because i think it's still an evolving uh yeah. topic in, in question I, yeah I, I think the ecological community researchers and coaches owes the rest of the coaching world an answer to the very important question what can you do with verbal instructions and what can't you do with them I think that challenge to us is a very real and sensible and legitimate challenge. And it's certainly, it's it's got wrapped up in a lot of toxic nonsense on social media. And I've certainly, I, I mean, when I threw my thread out, I was, 
I'm going to have to stop doing this. I tend to throw these grenades and then just watch them because it helps me articulate, like it helps me think about what's going on. Um, but it's it's not, yeah, I don't think it's all that helpful. But I think, I think, we, I think we owe the universe uh, an answer to what is clearly a really important question. Um, and yeah, I like, but, but, and again, you know, uh, Raji, thinking about, um, thinking about bringing the, the, you know, the, the, the academic and the practical together and having them actually talking to another and running in parallel, but with, you know, with communication and things. Um, again, I think we're, I don't, I don't think us academics are going to quite ask the right questions unless we, unless we interface properly with, with practitioners yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 you know, vice versa. I really think it sort of goes both ways, but um, it's, look, it's clearly on everyone's mind because this is how this this if you want to drop a bomb on sports twitter drop this bomb and just walk away and watch because it's a, you know people clearly care right. and people really really it's a it's a it's a flashpoint for people really giving a damn about what the answer is and i think that's i think i think we should notice that that that's that's how important it is to everyone yeah rajiv do you have any uh, final thoughts yeah i mean i, I think to me again it, it comes down to i mean I, i'm more a I guess I'm less on the theory side than than Andrew, but uh, I mean, to me, I'd, I'd really like to see, um, you know, like when we were talking about these concepts, you know, having some some good data, you know, e either in the coaching world or in the experimental world, to talk about these would be would be really helpful. And I think, you know, again, if you know, if there's some some way to organize this effort so we can, you know, more sort of make an advance rather than all relying on our own experiences. I think. Uh, that potentially will help some fields move uh, forward. Yeah, no, I think that's a great, great point. And yeah, so I guess I put a going back, you know, in the ecological approach, I think we want to say clearly it, there's room for verbal instruction. It's not not coach not doing anything and standing out of the way and doing nothing. Uh, that's kind of a miscon. That's the straw man at the other end, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I and I think we as we talked about, I think we're getting a good handle on how to, if you decide you want to give a verbal instruction, um, you know, how to do it with analogies, explicit. I think the when, you know, the also the other question I think we got in a little bit in the transition feedback is if you do use a constraints approach and you're not, when do you step in? <laughs> do you let people explore randomly forever? And how do you, you know, so I think we do we still you're right, Andrew, I think in Rajiv, it's some of the work. At, we're all doing is trying to understand what are the key features you know when should we step in and you know try to give a command because you're right verbal giving verbal instructions is the most basic element of being a coach right it's the cheapest and most cheerful way as my former supervisor would say so but anyway so yeah so thank you very much guys and that was a really fun discussion i think we could we'll maybe we'll revisit this and later in uh <laughs> um, I think it's it's a growing topic, as I said. And thank you, everyone, for following along in the comments. Yeah, and thanks as well. Rob. This was fun. Thanks, yeah, everybody.